YouTube exists. The internet exists. There is so much information that is out there right now that if you don't know certain things, if you don't know the norms of the industry, what you should be looking for in a label partner, in a manager, in a publisher, in a lawyer, if you don't know those things and yet you are putting your career on the line to get into business with people who are controlling these things, then shame on you. Hey everyone, this is Professesh the podcast and I'm your host, Sophia Welch. Every week, Professesh is presenting conversations with smart, successful, no BS music industry professionals, all with the goal of helping new artists and those who support them build their creative careers with great advice, stories, tips, and insights. Today's guest is Chris Maltese. He's the head of artist services at the U.S. division of Believe, the label and distribution company, where he currently builds out and oversees multiple labels. Um, He's also worked at MTV. He's worked as an artist manager. There are so many great insights in this one um, because Chris is an industry vet, but he also is a student of the industry. He listens to podcasts, he reads books, he watches YouTube videos, all to educate himself and to stay up to date on the very business that he's worked in since he graduated college. Um, So we talk about his key takeaways from every chapter of his career. Check it out. I I wanna talk about MTV because I feel like maybe younger people now don't know, but this would have been like at the time that you graduated college, like the place to work for people who love music. Um, and so I'm wondering how you got that job and, uh, or how, I guess how you landed it. When I was in college, um, I had a fraternity brother that was like a year or two older than me. So he had graduated and he got a job at MTV and, uh, we were both, you know, studying communications with a, with a concentration on TV and film. Um, so he went off and he got this, this job at MTV. And so my senior year, I needed an internship. He helped me get one at MTV. And then I ended up, you know, turning that internship into a full-time gig. Once uh, I graduated on a Tuesday and I started with them on a Thursday, like my full-time job. Okay. So the original plan was not necessarily to work with artists or in music. It was TV. And then it sort of, that's the way that it happened was that you were talking to artists a lot. I would say from like a really early age, I was very into music. So I, I knew that I wanted to be in the entertainment business. I didn't know what that meant. And I figured if I just got my foot in the door, I'll eventually figure it out. And that's exactly what happened. Right. Okay. So then how did you make the shift from MTV and then you went into artist management, right? Yeah. You know, I was, uh, I was at MTV for eight years and about halfway through there, I started to figure out, this is really cool. I'm interviewing the biggest celebrities in the world every single day. Um, but I knew it wasn't where I was going to be forever. I started to grow an entrepreneurial side of me. So I started to fit to, to question, you know, well, I, I kind of, all these artists are coming in for these interviews and I'm starting to figure out, okay, that's the publicist. That's the manager. That's the tour manager. That's the wardrobe, you know, the, the hair and makeup, you know, just, that's the label rep. I was just trying to figure out who's doing what. And eventually I got to a point where I decided I kind of want to be on that side. At that point, I had to figure out what's my value. If I was going to work with an artist today, what could I bring to the table? I don't work at a record label. I'm not a stylist. Uh, I'm not a publicist. Like what, what is it that I can do? And at that time, MTV used to, um, you know, occasionally, not even occasionally, often they would Chiron the songs that were playing within their shows. A Chiron is essentially when a show is playing and you see at the bottom of the screen where it mentions the the name of the artist and the name of the song. Mm -hmm. So I figured, oh, well, I could maybe help get some artists onto MTV shows and that's great exposure for them. So I started to do that. Those syncs you know, wound up leading to phone calls from record labels and lawyers and managers for these artists who wouldn't know how to handle it because they weren't, you know, they were nobodies. So they would call me back and say, Hey, I got a phone call from this guy because you got my, my song on that show. Could you take this meeting with me or can you call him back and like, see what he wants to do? Or, you know, so I kind of like inadvertently 
fell into the management thing. So at that point I decided, okay, I'm just going to try Like, let me just see what happens. So I decided to find an artist. Um, you know, I found this, this one kid on MySpace. I'm dating myself here clearly, <laughs> uh, you know, and I thought he was super talented initially reached out about, you know, maybe, you know, let me see if I can get my songs or I'm sorry, your songs on our TV shows. And eventually I convinced him to just let me manage him. And I was, you know, part of my sales pitch. I, I was just so naive at the time. I was like, look, let me manage you. You know, we'll get to number one on my space. We'll, we'll, you know, we'll showcase in front of all the labels. We'll sign a label deal. We'll do a publishing deal. We'll tour the world. We'll have a big hit. And I kind of like sold this package having no experience at all, mm -hmm. but that's exactly what happened. So I sort of spoke it to existence. And, um, you know, once that did happen, Mm -hmm. started spending more time on my management career than my work on MTV. So at that point I started to realize like, okay, I'm going to take this, I'm going to just take the shot and, and take this seriously. And we ended up signing a big publishing deal. And uh, once we hit like the top five at radio and then I, I left MTV to, to, to become a full-time manager. I want to break this down a little bit because it sounds like you kind of were just learning by doing how did you know what you were even talking about at that point yeah you know i i will tell you this i didn't know what i was doing okay. but i was fortunate enough to know some some of the lingo and how the most successful people carry themselves and the reason why i knew that was like i said i was interviewing the biggest stars in the world the, mm -hmm. the jay-z's the beyonce's the justin timberlake's this is who i was around on a daily basis and their teams. And so I got to see a lot of how that interaction took place. A lot of what was important when they were talking, you know, I'll get hit up, you know, from, from kids in college and stuff. And, you know, a lot of them saying, well, I don't really want to do it yet because I don't know everything. And I'm always like, no, everything. Like I'm in this business over 20 years. I still don't know everything. Nobody right. knows everything. You're never going to know everything. The business is constantly changing and evolving and there are new norms and, you know, you can't be worried about what you don't know. You just have to have the faith and the confidence to know that you will learn as you go. I'm curious about what it was about that artist that you, the, the one that you found on MySpace that drew you to him. Yeah. I would say that he, the music itself grabbed me there was an aesthetic there. I mean, even on his MySpace page, he had his own logo that, you know, looked original and it seemed like it was put together. Um, but then there was also definitely a willingness to speak to the fans on a one-on-one -on -one basis. And that formula is what catapulted him to number one on MySpace. Him being number one on MySpace is what got me the showcases with all the major labels. We did one in New York and one in, in, in LA. And then those showcases is what eventually led to his deal, which eventually led to the success. So, you know, it really started with, with again, with his music, um, the aesthetic, but then really his, his ability to market himself by putting himself out there and speaking uh, to the fans on a one-on-one -on -one basis. You mentioned you saw how the artist managers carried themselves. Yeah. And so going off of that, I, I would love for you to expand on what you mean by that, but also, you know, what makes for a good artist manager? Sure. I mean, the, the first part of that question in terms of what I saw from, you know, just being on a different side of the business back when I was in MTV was there's a certain level of professionalism. And I can see that the entire time that these guys were in my presence, their sole focus was their client. Their sole focus was does everything around look right? Are, are the people in the room supposed to be in the room? Are there, you know, is the car going to be ready as soon as we're ready to leave here? Like it was a level of attentiveness that and professionalism and the way that they spoke to the, you know, the other staff members um, that I feel like it's, it was very quick to see that it wasn't just like the artist had their friends around. The manager was the business guy. The manager was the one that was overseeing everything. And then on the flip side of like what makes a, you know, a, a good, a, a great manager versus a, an average manager or a good manager. For one, I think you got to be a great listener because you have to understand what it is that your artist needs. 
not all artists need exactly the same thing. Some artists are great at certain things and terrible at others. So they need that slack picked up, you know? So I, I would say like developmental artists, like the artists that are still just kind of getting started, they sort of need help with everything. Everything might mean they don't even make it to their sessions on time. Like you, you may have to physically get them out of bed at times. Like it, there's just a different level of what an artist needs. And as a manager, you need to understand what all of those needs are and either be able to, um, you know, circumvent the issues before they happen or have other people around to do that. And then the other thing is it kind of goes back to what I was saying before is that you have to understand that you don't understand everything because there's just no way to know everything and that's okay. So you do have to realize that it pays to have a great lawyer because the lawyer knows more about the law than you do and the contracts than you do. It pays to have a great, you know, booking agent because you're not going to be the one booking the shows. And even if you are right now, if your artist grows, you're not going to eventually it pays to have all the other, you know, pieces in place. It pays to have a great relationship with your label because you want them to be on your side and paying attention because they can really easily forget about you, all of those things. And then last thing I would say, is just being a great human being, you know, musicians are, for the most part, you know, they're, they're, they're fragile people. They're, they're emotional. They're, they're, they pour their heart out through their art. So you, I think being a good person and being a good human being and showing that you're trustworthy um, and showing that you care. I mean, that's half the battle. I, I can't tell you how many, uh, how many, you know, relationships I've made throughout this business sometimes with me just giving without ever asking for anything back, knowing that down the line at some point I'm going to run into this person again. Like I want to be on great terms with them. There are so many people I've seen go from interns to running their, you know, full companies. So it's, uh, you always want to be a good human being. Yeah. I like that. I think it's, you know, we talk a lot in this podcast about like what you need to know and the business side of things and what you can and can't say and do. And I, I think that's, so nicely distilled. It's just like, just be a good person, be good to people because that people don't forget that. That goes both ways. If you're an artist that is just super difficult and you make everybody else's job around you like harder, mm -hmm. people don't want to go the extra mile for you when you're, you know, not a great human. And I can tell you that too, like being at MTV, same thing. Like there were certain artists and celebrities who had reputations, some of them not so great, some of them phenomenal. And when it came time for opportunities, like there were always conversations about like, Oh, that one is so great to work with. Let's get them in here. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So it's, yeah. I just feel like you always want to, um, you know, regardless of what side you're on, what, you know, what your role is, I think being a good human is, is going to get you a lot farther than, you know, always just looking out for your best interest and being miserable. All right. So now you're under this, like we spoke about this tune core believe umbrella you're building out and overseeing multiple labels. I'm wondering what things you have to consider now that you did not have to consider as an artist manager. It's a great question. And just, just to be clear. So I, I head up the U S division of believe for their, their label services division. Believe is the company that owns TuneCore. So TuneCore is, you know, straight DIY distribution. We're all one happy family. I, I talk to those people all the time. Uh, there is a lot that we do intersect with. Um, but yeah, I'm really running the label division of, of believe. Uh, but that being said, um, you know, some of the things that we look for on the label side versus being a manager is, you know, when you're, when you are the manager, you are tied to every revenue stream that there is. So if the artist is touring, you're making a commission on that. If merch is sold, you're making a commission on that. If he's doing a publishing deal, you're making commission on that. Your record sales, your brand deals, uh, licensing. There's so many different revenue streams that you're looking at when you're a manager. On the label side, you know, we're making our money essentially almost entirely from streaming at this point. We're not involved in the touring. We're not involved in the merch. We're not involved in the publishing. However, we're contributing a lot of money into building these artists. So, you know, 
for good or for bad, we do have to take into consideration where the artist is in the marketplace at the mo- at this moment, if we're going to sign them, meaning we need to look at the numbers, right? We need to kind of figure out like, okay, if this is where they're at, how much is it worth in terms of an investment that doesn't seem too risky so that we can help build them and start to grow, you know, their business even more from the royalty side, because that's the only place that we're going to make money from it. Is there anything else that artists should be doing to differentiate themselves when they're just starting out? Sure. Well, well, for one, it's, it's, it's the music for sure. I mean, nobody wants to, you know, nobody wants to listen to you and say, Oh, you're another Drake. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, you need some sort of originality. So it all starts with the studio and the, and, and the creativity. And yeah, going back, I do think talking to fans one-on-one is so underrated, especially in today's world with DMs and all the social networking that takes place. You don't understand what a one-on-one connection, how that will breed a group of what I call lifers. Because once you make that connection, that, art, that, art, that fan is no longer a fan of a song. They're a fan of an artist. And there's a very big difference between those two. They're, they're going to be with you for a long time if you, you know, grow a, 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 an army of lifers. Also, somewhat going back to what we were speaking about before, we're living in the greatest age ever in that YouTube exists. The internet exists. There is so much information that is out there right now that if you don't know certain things. If you don't know the norms of the industry, what you should be looking for in a label partner, in a manager, in a publisher, in a lawyer, if you don't know those things and yet you are putting your career on the line to get into business with people who are controlling these things, then shame on you because all of that information is free and it's all out there. So if I was a brand new artist today and you know I wanted to get ahead outside of the things that we've already discussed, I absolutely would be scheduling every single day a certain amount of time. It might be when I first wake up, it might be an hour in the afternoon, it might be when I get home from work at night, whatever the case may be, every single day I would be scheduling time to A, talk to my fans directly one-on-one and B, learning. And by the way, I do this today. I am still making sure that every single day I'm picking up new information. But the more that you understand how the business works, the better you're going to be able to operate, the more you're going to be able to look out for even the people that are on your team and hold people accountable. Um, All of those things are really important. If you're trying to be an industry professional, the other big thing I would say is if you don't have a LinkedIn account, you're already like behind the curve. Mm -hmm. I can't tell you how many relationships I've made, people I've met, um, deals that have gotten done because every day I go onto LinkedIn and I see who they're suggesting for me to be in touch with. And every day I try to follow or, or reach out to at least one new person. Today, I had a phone call with somebody that I met over LinkedIn who was a publicist, but is now working more in the brand space. And it turns out we know a lot of the same people and you know, I'm sending over the roster and you know, we're talking about potential deals already. So networking, if you're trying to get into the industry is huge and, and you can do it again. Like this stuff didn't exist years ago. It was all about in person. So if you can get on LinkedIn and you can start to build your, you know, Rolodex, even though college kids won't know what that, that word means anymore, but if you can build your network, um, that you're only gonna, you're all, that's only going to pay you dividends. Amazing. So I know, I feel like we covered a lot. I think everyone is going to get a huge amount from this. So thank you. Awesome. Glad to hear it. I'm glad we got to do this. Hey everyone. Thanks so much for tuning in. I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, be sure to follow Claudio on Instagram and YouTube for more episodes and a lot more content just like this, all for young creatives. Um, also be sure to follow our guests at the links in the description and we will see you next time.